Hello, I'm Steve McGee, and uh, I missed your name. It was Jocelyn. Jocelyn, Jocelyn. I'm here from Seattle. And um, one of the things I observed from my own teachers, the excellent teachers, the people who inspired me uh, to do what I, my passion is, is what I noticed if you spend enough time with these same teachers over a year or longer, they do repeat themselves. And, uh, and it's, it's just this five minute moment that Abraham and John are talking about. I always I refer to it as a clinical script. And uh, one script that I have, and you can use this script um, whether or not the patient has the condition, but just if it comes up at the bedside, is how to diagnose Parkinson's disease. And um, so I usually will introduce myself to the patient, explain who my audience is, that they we're here today really just for teaching purposes. Although often I'll deliver this, uh, this particular script if uh, we're on bedside rounds and an elderly patient has frequently fallen and the question comes up, does this patient have Parkinson's disease? So I don't have slides. I'll just do it uh, the way I would normally do it. And uh, the first point I make is that the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease uh, depends entirely on what you see, hear, and feel at the bedside. There is no technologic test for Parkinson's disease. And um, what you're looking for is the three cardinal findings of Parkinsonism. And uh, as you all know, those three findings are the resting tremor, the rigidity, and bradykinesia. Uh, and what I'll do is just say a, a few words about each of these. The resting tremor, uh, typically, is there's only two phenotypes of tremor. There's one when the muscles are electrically inactive. That's a resting tremor. The, mus the hand is just resting down at the side. And then there's the other tremor, the one the patient's making the muscles electrically active. That's called an action tremor. Those are your only two uh, that there are. But anyway, in Parkinson's disease, it is a resting tremor. And classically, it's a five cycles per second tremor, and this will become important in a moment. And I may demonstrate it, that it, uh, it's a pill rolling tremor, like that, or a supination pronation tremor. And I make the point, perfect, I make the point that um, this is five cycles per second. And if you do the math, there are 60 seconds per minute, which means the Parkinsonian tremor is 300 cycles per minute which is the exact same frequency of atrial flutter. And this brings up two important things. If you're interested in seeing what flutter waves look like in the neck veins of a patient who has atrial flutter, if you position the patient strategically at the right angle in the neck, you will see the neck do what looks like a Parkinsonian tremor. It's the exact same frequency. And the other side of that is you can have a patient with Parkinson's disease, and I'm sure all of you have seen this, where their electrocardiogram is picking up what looks like flutter waves, and what it's picking up is their own tremor. And then if you're careful, you notice that those flutter waves do not line up with the QRS. That's, of course, pseudoatrial flutter. So that's the resting tremor. We have resting tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia. The rigidity you elicit by asking the patient to keep the limbs floppy and explain to them that you're just going to maybe uh, flex and extend the elbow. You can test it at the elbow. You can test it at the wrist. And one of the hardest things for patients to do is tell them to relax. The minute you tell them to relax, people do kind of get tense. And so you want to kind of repeatedly do this. And I often use the words, uh, Jocelyn, please try and keep your limb as floppy as you can. There we go. And what you're going to perceive with rigidity is uh, increased resistance to movement. And when you feel increased resistance to movement, really there are three choices, uh, but two big choices. One would be spasticity, the other is rigidity. And those two phenotypes differ. Someone with spasticity will have a weak extremity, of course. And with spasticity, the resistance you feel in one direction is much different than the resistance you feel in the other direction. So for example, the resistance with flexion may be very slight, a lot of resistance to extension. There's a big difference between flexion and extension in spasticity, and that's what creates the characteristic postures of someone with hemiparesis. 
And then the other feature is spasticity, is it's velocity dependent. The faster you go, the more resistance you feel. Rigidity, in contrast, the extremity is not weak. The resistance that you feel when the patient's trying to be floppy is the same with flexion and extension. There are no characteristic postures, and it is not velocity dependent. So, and then sometimes, you know, the rigidity of Parkinson's disease has that cogwheel character, but really all that is is rigidity plus tremor. The cogwheeling is the same frequency as the, the tremor. The third feature is bradykinesia, and there's many ways to quantify that, but one thing I do, in fact, Often uh, what I'll do if I know the question is going to come up, does this patient have Parkinson's disease, I will hold an index card that I've written on there. Uh, I, I guess I, I would write on there, count the number of times that the patient blinks. And um, that's one way to quantify bradykinesia. And of course, you don't want to draw the patient's attention that that's what you're doing. Most of us blink 28, 30 times per minute uh, if we're not thinking about it. Uh, where someone with Parkinson's disease, it's a much reduced frequency. It's 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 times per minute. Okay, we have the three cardinal features of Parkinsonism. Resting tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia. If a patient has two out of those three, then what you say is your patient has Parkinsonism. And as it turns out, some of those patients have Parkinson's disease, pathologically, and some do not. And those that do not are collectively called Parkinson plus syndromes. And in fact, studies show if you rely on just two out of those three features, you'll be wrong uh, saying the diagnosis is Parkinson's disease about a quarter of the time. So how do you finesse this a little bit more? You add three other features that would increase the probability of Parkinson's disease. And these three are as follows. One, the findings you have the rigidity and the essential tremor are, uh, excuse me, the uh, resting tremor are very asymmetric. Someone with Parkinson's disease will have a tremor in one hand, rigidity in that side, and then maybe rigidity in the same leg years before it'll affect the other side. So asymmetry is the key that your patient with Parkinsonism has Parkinson's disease. Um, the other feature is that they can have no atypical features. And if students are interested, I will explain to them what those are. They can't be, um, have difficulty looking down, uh, which is not a feature of Parkinson's disease. They can't be on neuroleptics, which of course causes Parkinsonism. They can't have long track signs. They can't have cerebellar signs. They can't have profound orthostatic hypotension. But there's a list of very atypical features for Parkinsonism that if present should question the disease of Parkinson's disease. And then the last criterion is that they respond to levodopa. And so you have the two out of three features of Parkinsonism, and then you add those three other qualifiers, asymmetric onset, asymmetric findings at the bedside, no atypical features, and then a positive response to levodopa. And that's the lesson. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.